On February 26, 2015, a major conflict was taking over the news cycle. People around the world started weighing in and taking sides over the issue, oftentimes leading to heated exchanges that resulted in broken relationships and, in some cases, death threats. In less than seven days, almost 10 million tweets were shared. This wasn't a divide that was fueled by partisanship. There was no terrorist attack. Donald Trump had not even begun tweeting about being president yet. This, in fact, was about the dress. <laughs> the dress was a viral internet photo that had people disagreeing whether this article of clothing in question was black and blue or white and gold. In less than 24 hours, it broke BuzzFeed's record for the most number of concurrent users and reached almost 33 million people. That's more than either Democrats or Republicans had participating in the respective primaries. <laughs> now, as somebody who studies online culture, I actually care not that much about the number of people that see something, but what I really care about is the engagement factor, the interactions that people have with one another, especially how those interactions ultimately drive behavior. So, when people say things like, don't read the comments section, that's when I get really interested. Because while not every single remark made online is thought-provoking, <laughs> neither, yeah, neither is every single concept or remark you'll hear at a town hall or in Congress or our places of worship either. We know that those opinions and those experiences can vary pretty drastically. They can be things that are kind of awkward or genuinely funny, especially when you see how they could kind of play out and lead to further comments. And they could be kind of really inappropriate, depending on the context of, of what's being shared. And <laughs> there's certainly they're certainly the kind of comments that actually make you question the value of having a comment section at all. <laughs> but that's kind of the nature of comments, right? <laughs> you hear that refrain all the time, don't read the comment section. But when people say that, they're not referring to these like hilarious or kind of awkward or quirky comments that are out there. When people say that, they're actually referring to actual beliefs that they don't share, oftentimes shared in a way that might be distasteful or even offensive. But unlike popular internet advice out there, I think it's important. I think, yes, you should read the comments section because you should learn how to connect with people who you disagree with. This is my steadfast belief. Apathy is not compatible with love. Ignorance is not the fuel for compassion. We're living in one of the most divided eras of our country right now. A recent Pew Research poll found that 41% of Democrats believe Republicans to be a serious threat to our country. On the other side, 45% of Republicans feel the same way about Democrats. <laughs> Tensions are rising over interpretations of events of police brutality and racism, and oftentimes those divisions fall along racial lines. And it seems like we're getting more divided than ever, despite having internet feeds that are curated specifically for us. It's a phenomenon known as filter bubbles. In other words, your social media feed, the news that you read, the world events that you hear and see through your mobile device, your, your computer, is actually curated for you. It's supposed to address your own personal bias uh, so that you get things that you agree with more often than not, depending on how you engage. That's actually making views more extreme rather than more nuanced and balanced. And so some people start blaming the internet itself, the technology itself, as the problem. And there are those who feel that way and they actually begin disengaging. They decide to turn off Facebook or block people or unfriend them. But blocking and unfri unfriending people to have a more comfortable existence only leads to more isolation of your own views. <laughs> Some people retreat and instead of reading major news sites, 
they go to their own trusted sources. But those tend to be sources that have a clear bias because it speaks to a very specific worldview. Other people see technology as the solution. For example, there's this common belief out there that it's the anonymous nature of the internet that makes people so vicious and aggressive. And that's why Google actually links all YouTube comments to personal accounts now. However, a recent study from the University of South Australia found that non-anonymous users are actually more aggressive than anonymous ones. Then there are new sites who have lost all hope and faith. <laughs> the Washington Post, NPR, USA Today all have canceled the comments sections on their respective websites. There's a couple of people that are adapting to this phenomenon. The Verge actually kept the comments section, but now they edit them for length and treat it more like a letters to the editor section. Norway has this new site called NRK. And what they do is they make you take a quiz about the article you just read before being able to comment. <laughs> It's pretty smart. <laughs> so they're hoping that people who are forced to kind of test their way through it will actually have a more nuanced conversation. Will any of this actually work, though? Maybe. Rather than s simply seeing technology as a tool, I think we should instead treat it as a symbol. How does the internet, how does social media represent society itself? I oftentimes like to think of social media as the world's biggest cocktail party. Some people have obviously had too much to drink. <laughs> but changing the dynamics of the party and how people engage doesn't actually address the core issue. We need to begin with a new protocol, one that's rooted in empathy, one that's rooted in compassion. A lot of times, people have this assumption that Americans are divided because we have different values. But we don't have different values. We only have different interpretations and experience different emphases of values that we already share as a country. But how will you ever know that if you don't actually see other people see what they see or if you hear their particular stories? We need to reach out and learn about other people's experiences. There are so many benefits of having a robust online conversation. You get a litmus test on how other people are feeling. You get to find out instantly, am I credible? And more importantly, you get to test your own values. One of the best ways to test your own values is to see if they can resonate with somebody who has a different experience than you. The new progress or advancement of our society shouldn't be based on if you win an internet argument or not. But it should be instead if you can learn how to develop more compassion in the face of opposition. Now, I'm not saying that you need to spend every waking moment addressing every comment made on the internet, but I'm saying you should at least take a moment, pause, and think about this, and ask yourself, is it worth losing a valued relationship with another human being because of something in your Facebook feed? Will you actually build a better community by ignoring and shutting other people down? I don't think so. Because the cure for bad speech on the internet isn't censorship. It's better speech. It's more nuanced speech, and speech that can actually resonate with other people's values. Remember, apathy is not compatible with love. Ignorance doesn't actually drive compassion. It might not be the nicest place, but I believe you can begin with the comments section. Thank you.